The series begins with a horrific accident as a boy gets his leg crushed by a machine. Hobbling home, he tries to sleep it off, and meanwhile, we're introduced to our protagonist, Gyoru, who apparently has Asperger syndrome. He stands at an aquarium, admiring all the fish, and he notices differences between them all, being able to name every species and noting the intricate details of their anatomies. The people working there are very impressed, which prompts Gyoru's best friend, Namu, to arrive and she picks him up lavishing praise on him. But the problem was, Gyoru couldn't hear any of this since he had headphones on. Anyways, Gyoru heads home and is greeted warmly by his father, who makes a delicious breakfast for the both of them. He runs a company called Move to Heaven, which is used to arrange items left behind by the deceased at their house. Their latest client is that of a hard-working guy called Sion Yu, whom they pay respect to before emptying out the drawers. The pair work respectfully together, with Gyoru and Jiong Yu both working out what sort of life this boy had. They pack away most most of his precious possessions into one box, everything else is being emptied out. The pair intend to stop by the funeral on the way, as Jung Yu is clearly troubled by what has taken place. As they start to drive, Gyo Ru notices the convenience store Sion Yu used to frequent, and now it becomes apparent that his intent to freshen up after work could be well linked to the cashier there. As the pair show up at the funeral, Jung Yu notices Sion Yu's boss giving a small severance packet to his mother, claiming that it's their fault and that they don't have any responsibility for this. It turns out Sion Yu's mom is actually deaf, and a translator hands over the box of possessions for them to go through. Sion Yu, as we soon come to learn, is the boy from the start of the episodes. His texts confirm that he got hurt in a work accident, and his boss refused to let him have some time off. It's a heartbreaking turn of events, and one that sees Jung Yu unable to listen to Sion Yu's boss berate the deceased and his family any further. It's disrespectful, especially Especially at the funeral, and Zhang Yu grabs the man's arms and forces him to face Sun Yu's mom. He translates her words for him, and she hands back the envelope and tells him she doesn't want it and that she won't trade her son's life for money. Meanwhile, Gyo Ru gets into a spot of trouble when he follows a nurse into the hospital. It turns out he wanted her bat to give to Sion Yu, but it takes Zhang Yu arriving to clear up the situation. When Zhang Yu receives a call, he leaves Gyo to wash the fish in the fish tank while he heads upstairs to talk to the lawyer. On his way back, Jung Yu suddenly collapses, clutching his chest in pain. People walk past him while he was passed out on the ground as Gyo Ru waits patiently in the car. Jung Yu rings through and apologizes to him, and an ambulance races to the scene, taking Jung Yu to the hospital. Gyo Ru arrives to drive off, but all goes horribly wrong as he stops on the bridge and holds up traffic. A police officer knocks on the window, but it takes Namu showing up to help calm down Gyo Ru. She throws her arms around him and sobs, as Jung Yu has passed away. We then cut forward to the funeral where Jung Yu's body has been cremated, and Gyo Ru receives the ashes but finds himself frozen to the spot, unwilling to let go. Remembering the last words his father said, the boy repeats the message. Dad is always with Gyoru as he tries to piece together his life without his father. Some time passes and Gyoru's uncle shows up and he's a very rude and arrogant man who smokes inside the house. He's now living with Gyoru and as of this moment, things are about to take a turn for the worst. The scene cuts back in time and we see Gyoru's uncle, San Ko, leaving the correctional facility. Lawyer O oh shows up and informs him that his brother has passed away, leading Sang Ko to chuckle and actually be grateful for his death. Within his will, Zheng Yu has named Sang Ko to be Gyoru's legal guardian, and he's not aware of Gyoru's condition and eventually turns and walks away. He heads to a local bar where cage fighting takes place in the back, and he asks the owner about the guardianship, learning that he can take what's Gyoru's and make it his own. This is what changes his mind and also piques his interest. According to lawyer O, oh, Gyoru has a sizable inheritance left behind, which Sang Ko wants for himself. Legally speaking, there's not a lot that Namu can do, but she agrees to keep an eye on Sang Ko to make sure he doesn't misbehave. 
Meanwhile, Gyoru and Senko start to argue, leading the former to begin beating his head against the door. Nambu heads back inside and explains the situation with Senko forced into a tent. Sanko clearly resents Jung Yu marrying and turning his life around, and he's completely indifferent to Gyoru's needs. That evening, he walks nonchalantly up to Gyoru, who was clutching a pillow tightly while sitting cross-legged on the floor. Sanko simply blows smoke in his face and promises to look after Jung Yu's precious son. Gyoru heads to the aquarium, eventually forcing Namu there to help out as the boy pounds his head into a glass. In the morning, the pair are shocked to find Sanko has left the house. Namu calls lawyer O, who confirms there's a three-month trial period, and if Sanko fails the test for being a guardian at the time, then they will have to reconsider a different option. Namu promises to be a fair judge of character and remain impartial, while Gyuru does his best to clean up the house, eventually heading out with Sanko to the next address for work. Senko was quite the erratic driver, and he speeds through the streets, much to Gyuru's horror. Given how much many traffic offenses that they broke, Senko was impressed by his work. However, he's less impressed with the interior of Miss Lee's room, with maggots across the floor and an odious stench, and he winds up being sick outside. He was unable to continue on, prompting Gyuru to go at it alone. Inside, Gyuru follows his father's guidance, remembering his rules for how to properly undress this room and paying respect to Miss Lee's memories. With the yellow box full of possessions, all the relatives were interested in was money, and in fact, they were so hungry for it that they even put on gloves and collected up the putrid notes stashed under the mattress. They were absolutely shameless, and Sanko watches this take place from the doorway. Eventually, they tell Gyuru to decontaminate the notes so they can exchange them, and eventually the pair head home after Mr. Park shows up from waste management. Sanko throws the yellow box on his back and watches him drive away, and meanwhile Gyuru is set to work decontaminating the notes. In doing so though, he heads back to the bank and intends to solve the puzzle of why the notes were under the bed in the first place, and he's figured something out. In the following scene, we see Lee Yon's son drawing money from her bank every week, and it's always 50,000 won, and this, as it turns out, seems to be a direct result of her dementia. Gyuru figures it out too and takes a lollipop, heading outside as he follows a location tracker on his phone, but by following the map app, his phone dies. Thankfully, he manages to make it back home where both Namu and Sanko stand waiting for him, and in fact, Namu decides to join him at work, but her mother was not happy. She believes the job entails clearing out bodies and immediately berates her for low aspirations. Namu does manage to convince her father, who agrees to let her work for three months. When she heads back to Gyuru's house, she finds him distraught and caught in a headlock with Sanku. Gyuru is trying to find the yellow box to give back to the family, which was the same yellow box that Sanku threw in the trash, and eventually he had been to throwing it away. This prompts the trio to head out to the dump site, intent on trying to find the yellow box. This was easier said than done, of course, as the group finds themselves shifting through garbage for it, and eventually they do find it, but upon speaking to Mrs. Lee's son, Park Chil Yu, Gyuru refuses to give him the money, and he needed to follow the boy instead. As they head up a tailor's shop, it turns out that the money was actually being saved up by Mrs. Lee to buy Chil Yu a suit. He was not interested in this though, claiming that he just wants his money. However, as he wrestles with the yellow box, it spits out some terminal underwear still in its wrapping. It turns out that this was the first thing that he bought his mother with his paycheck. It also links back to Mrs. Lee's desire to try and buy a suit for him. It's all linked together and Gyoru figured it out by himself. Chou Yu breaks down and finally begins grieving, sobbing for his deceased mother. 
That evening, Sanko was stopped by the club promoter and forced back into the ring again and she had a disclaimer and makes him throw a fight for her and then he sports a cut lip for his troubles. It seems that he had a debt and needed to fight in order to pay it off and this may also explain why he's so hell-bent on Gyuru's inheritance. Namu senses something was up. Especially when she notices Sanko showing up cuts and bruises all over him. It seems her initial theory that he has a girlfriend has been thrown out, and anyway, a new case for Move to Heaven brings the trio together. Only Officer Jun Yong happens to be there, as someone who Namu clearly likes. They show up at the very rough scene, and blood stains the floorboards, and it seems like a killing took place two weeks ago. There's not much to investigate though, especially with the crime scene already examined. With his usual ritual, Gyuru removes his hat and pays his respects to Lee Seong Young before starting work. The next scene begins with a statement regarding Son Young's murder at the hands of her boyfriend. Apparently, Seong Young came at him with a knife and threatened to off herself and the pair then wrestled with the knife and eventually, this led to Mr. Kim falling on top of her, the knife plunged through her belly. With the trio from Move to Heaven ready to clean up, Sang Ko was mistaken for a corpse cleaner outside and meanwhile Gyuru plays a moonlight sonata while fixing up the yellow box for the relatives. With the residents stressed out, the landlord arrives and asks them to move the van and Gyuru believes they should split this job into two days with the first seeing them tidying up the apartment and the second sterilizing and cleaning it. As Seung Ko heads back inside, ripping down the wallpaper, this very act brings back memories of the past for him. Specifically, he remembers the cries of his parents fighting as the horrific domestic abuse starts to show and explains Seung Ko's defenses. Elsewhere, Namu and Gyuru head to the kindergarten the deceased worked in with numerous books for the different students. Out there, Gyuru notices a sign for Rose class and believes they need to find Ian Mi and it turns out that Seong Young knitted clothes, a gift for her unborn child. Ian Mi sobs though, claiming that this is all her fault and she discredits the statement given about Seong Young being aggressive with the knife. In fact, bruises indicate a historic domestic violence and Seong Young even quit her job too. Guru finds himself unable to sleep and deliberates over the lack of a pet at Lee's apartment. In the middle of the night, Guru immediately heads out and Sang Ko reluctantly follows as our protagonist gets to work, finding a camera that could shed light on what's happened. Eventually, he finds it tucked away inside the air conditioning unit and while Mr. Kim gives his statement, Sang Ko demands that they call the police. Well, this then shows video footage of what happened that night, played for the investigators to see, and Mr. Kim grabbed a knife and came at her, stabbing the girl nonchalantly in the stomach while declaring there's only one way she can leave him and that comes from her dying. He was putting on an act this entire time and now they have the evidence to put him away. All of this is thanks to Gyoru of course, as he was the one who noticed an instructional manual for a security camera. It's a satisfaction satisfying end to what's otherwise been a very traumatic case. Guru sees the murder leave the prosecutor's office and shows Mr. Kim Mosiak drawn up by all the other kids who clearly think the world of her. Unfortunately, her life was taken long before she had died thanks to the domestic violence that she suffered from. It's a tragic loss of life and one that hopefully sees Kim realize what he's done while behind bars. More of Sanku's woes are realized when we come back to Guru's house and it turns out that he's got to pay 5 million won a week and that's just the interest. If he can't pay, he's going to be forced into fighting again and Namu notices Sanko leaving an estate agent and heads in for some details. It turns out that he was trying to sell Guru's property but right now she's not aware of all the details surrounding why. That evening, Sanko witnesses the same domestic abuse coming from his neighbors and this time he couldn't sit back and watch. Noticing the girl was barefoot, he stops the man from striking his partner and gets involved and he beats the man repeatedly, striking him in the face over and over again. Namu can only watch from afar, feeling shocked and eventually she heads back home and exhibits concern about Guru's well-being. 
However, Gil Ru confirms that his uncle has never struck him, and when Sang Ko heads back home again, his nephew notices a cut on his wrist and immediately gets him treated with ointment. Days turn to night, and Na Mu continues to track Sang Ko, and in fact, she follows him all the way to the club where she witnesses him fighting firsthand. Well, fight is hardly the word as Sang Ko is beaten down to a pulp, repeatedly smacked in the mouth to repay a debt that he seemingly was never going to repay. Next, we were at the Seha University Hospital in the middle of an intense hostage situation, and it's a shocking moment, one that sees Dr. Su Yun slashed across the neck for his troubles. As he bleeds out on the ground, the scene comes to an ominous end. We then cut to Gyul Ru at the aquarium again, pulling faces, and it's a brief respite, one that immediately sees the gang together to head up to their next case. They arrive at one village townhouse, which is where the doctor lived before he passed away. His full name was Jung Soon Young, and after their usual ritual of paying their respects, Gyu Ru and the others get to work, with our protagonist putting on his headphones. However, he quickly finds a letter in the room, and he shows this to Soo Young's father, who simply throws it in the fire, discarding it like trash. Gyu Ru tries to fish it out, but burns his hand in the process, and he was insisted that he delivers the letter, though given that it was Su Yun's only wish before he died. Sitting together, the group tries to figure out who this letter is for and settles on a mystery lover. They deduce that it could be linked to a classical music, especially all the different flyers for concerts. They all pack out different girls, eventually finding out that this clue matches up to a concert playing the following day. The mystery girl is likely to be there at the first blank concert, and while the receptionist initially refuses to let them in, a desperate Gyul Ru suddenly needs to use the bathroom, which is just the cue that they needed to bust in. They ask the different cellists playing whether if they know Su Yun, but none of them seem to be a match, and it turns out that it's actually Ian Park. This guy happens to be in the bathroom at the same time as Gil Ru, and he notices a tattoo spelling out Su Yun on his wrist. Gil Ru heads straight up to see him and blurts out that Su Yun has passed away. An awkward silence descends on them as Ian eventually races off, with him gone from the music a call, the other staff scrambled to try and find him and bring the man back. It turns out that he's left, distraught over the news of his lover's death. The crew tries to deduce where Ian and Su Yun first met, which leads them back to the hospital. The pair meet a year ago at Christmas where Su Yun was the doctor for Ian Park and heard him playing the cello. It was a beautiful song and one that sees both of them immediately grow closer together. There's obvious chemistry between them and the pair joke holding hands in public before heading to see a movie together. There, under the blanket of darkness, they hold hands. However, everything changes when Ian Park receives an invitation to go to San Francisco for school. Things fall apart between them as Su Yun's parents put pressure on their son to get married to a girl. Su Yun eventually turns away from Ian and decides to leave him at the airport, and Su Yun and Ian both part ways, but this decision clearly Clearly affects the both of them. Back in the present, Gil Ru finds Ian up on the rooftop and he hands over the box of personal belongings. Within it, the concert ticket and the plane ticket reinforce that Su Yan was going to leave to be with his lover. Thankfully, Gil Ru, memorizing his letter and echoed the words out loud, a brave, beautiful note about two lovers and how Su Yan doesn't want to live like a coward anymore. He even has a relationship ring for him, and the letter finishes with an I love you. That night at the concert, Ian Park paid tribute to Su Yun, whom he saw sitting in the crowd watching. Of all the songs that he chose, it was We Wish You a Merry Christmas, and this, of course, has a symbolic meaning dating back to when they met. The trio then heads back home and reflects on the case and the impact that it's had on them, and Sang Ko gets to thinking and reflects on Su Cho's words about something that he needs to say. Before we hear this, Sang Ko heads to the nursing home and checks on a comatose boy, whom soon finds out is called So Chiol, telling him that he's his mortal enemy and needs to wake up. 
This could be well linked to a fight promoter he owes money to, but right now it was too early to tell. The following scene begins with an old man called Kim In Soo working as a janitor lifting heavy boxes and bags. However, he is hit by a car while moving and it injures him badly. Getting dressed, he ignores the doctor's advice and discharges himself, and he heads into the adjacent room where his wife happens to be. Funnily enough, he runs into Sang Ko outside smoking, and he encourages the man to put out the cigarettes as the pair continue on their way. He even calls Sang Ko sir as a sign of respect, and in Korean culture, it is of course a big thing for an elder to call a junior sir. Meanwhile, Namu visits lawyer O oh and continues to express concerns about Sang Ko, discussing all the woes he's causing Gyo Ru so far. However, the three month period still stands, so there is not much more he can do. He does, however, refer to Namu as Gyu Ru's good tree. Sanku also shows his worth by lavishing praise on Namu and her mother when they cross paths. As Namu heads off on her own, Sanku and Gyu Ru both work together and prepare for another request. Sanku calls it an order to begin with until his nephew corrects him, and they both show up and find a note written by the elderly couple apologizing to the ones who came to clean up after us and confirm that they're leaving the world behind. It turns out their request from three days ago came in while In Su was still alive, and he was well aware that he was going to die. He wanted to do so on his own terms alongside his wife, Mi Sion, and she too was a long term patient at the nursing home. Sang Ko was not happy and links it to murder, and he eventually heads outside, scoffing at the notion and refusing to clean up. Gyo Ru heads inside and begins cleaning up the belongings, telling Sang Sang Ko that he's going to dock money from him. Eventually, Sang Ko does show up and help, but when he opens up the window, he finds a hidden door leading to a beautiful greenhouse. The social worker challenges Sang Ko's notion of decreasing himself upon this, telling him that it's an act of love. Gyo Ru decides against cleaning up this area for now, settling on visiting block 105 of the apartment block across the way. Once there, Gyo Ru begins knocking on different doors, looking to give back the plants from the greenhouse. Within this, we receive a telling flashback of In Go and his time with the landlord of the apartment block. A young girl helped raise funds to buy him an air conditioner, but he simply waved away the gift, telling the old man to buy one himself. Meanwhile, Sang Ko sits with the social worker, Yu Sin, who confirms that the couple took pills from the hospital. He clearly got them wrong, and this was only made worse by his situation with Seo Chol, and Sang Ku confronted the black-haired club promoter and told her that it's her fault if So Chol dies. He then pleads with her to bring him back no matter what. Kim In Su was given the awful diagnosis of terminal pancreatic cancer, and with this, he decided to grant his wife's wishes and head home together. For the funeral, the gang realizes that there is no family, but they do start collecting up the different flowers to place as a sign of respect. Each of these holds a different meaning, and with little Min Ji there too, they all pay their respects. Sanko also bows his head as well, eventually collecting up a wraith from the next funeral door to use for Insus. In fact, this, coupled with old business cards from 1981, was enough for Gil Ru to head into a funeral hall to give out to different people. Most don't recognize who Insu is, but when the chairman shows up, he most certainly does. With a walking stick, he heads into the room next door and sees the flowers laid out. He lights an incense stick, which signals the way for all these other workers to join in and bow. It was a beautiful sign that one sees the social worker Yu Rim growing closer to Sang Ko. Gyo Ru notices this too, and after dropping a card off, he gives Sang Ko a plant from Mr. Kim's greenhouse to look after, and it was apparently from Yu Rim, and it holds significant meaning. That night, Sang Ku receives a call from a sobbing Soon Jin, claiming that Su Chul is in critical condition. Fighting back tears, Sang Ko charges out of the house and toward the hospital. Sang Gu races through the streets, charging up to the hospital as fast as he can. 
When he gets there, he learns that Xiu Chul is not in a good mood, and he faints and he may have undergone surgery too. Sangu is determined not to let go so soon and he heads back to Gyu Ru's determined to rustle up the money needed to pay for the surgery. He finds the property registration forms and races outside, casting a glance at Jung Yu's photos and claiming that they're even now. With him gone, Namu speaks to Gyu Ru trying to gauge whether his uncle is actually good or evil. Even though he may have good intentions, clearly there's evil in him as well. We then cut back to 10 years to see Xiong Gu getting involved with So Chul, who was in the middle of being bullied when they first crossed paths. Sang Gu got involved and stopped the boy from jumping and ending his life, and slapping the other boys down with his hand, and this is what incites Seo Chul to get involved with boxing. Sang Gu's act of compassion brings the boy into the gym, and what begins as a simple student-teacher relationship soon blossoms into a brotherhood, and the pair exercise and work out together, and Su Jin arrives to see them getting along really well, and she happens to be So Chiu's sister. In fact, this whole endeavor brought So Chiu into the boxing ring originally, which in turn is what led to their devastation. Sangu was not ready to let go and heads back to the promoter, being given the money for the surgery. And this pins it all on one game. Without much of a choice, he signs the forms and arrives with the money ready for the surgery. But the problem was, he was too late. And apparently, So Chul had passed away around the time that Sangu was gone. The pair were distraught and now falls to So Chul to do what Gyu Ru had been doing all season long. He begins emptying out So Chul's belongings including photos, trophies and even medical documents, confirming a diagnosis of chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE to be precise. For those unaware, this occurs from multiple blows to the head which is also what led So Chul deciding to quit boxing. However, they're both involved in a fight against one another before they hang up the boxing gloves. It's a cruel turn of events, one orchestrated by the promoter, whom we soon learn is called Madam. So Cho claimed that he was there to make money for his new business, which of course, as we now know, was actually to pay for his medical bills. So Cho and Sangu fight in this sick and twisted game orchestrated by the promoter. She watches from afar while Jong Yu happens to be in the crowd. The anger Sangu feels culminates in one blow to So Chiu's face, where he falls down and never gets back up. Sangu is beside himself with guilt ridden grief when he sees this and calls out for his friend. This is what's been eating away at Xiong Gu all this time, and now it makes sense why he's been so desperate to keep So Chul alive. While he was clearing out the room, he sees a business card for Move to Heaven with instructions for Zhong Yu to show up and be there. Sangku struggles to hold back his rage filled tears, and with a box of So Chul's belongings, he hands it over to So Jin and heads out. Speaking to the promoter, he promises to pay off his debt and refuses to fight for her anymore, and in fact, he messages Gyo Ru and tells him that he's not coming back either. Namu charges over to check on the boy as Gyo Ru decides to try and find his uncle. He's doing manual labor, and as it turns out, but that doesn't stop Gyo Ru from putting up posters all around town. However, he's grabbed by a bunch of men while he's pinning up the posters and taken away. This was just collateral damage that this madam needs to force Sang Ko back into the ring again. Before this, he charges straight into the arena and checks on his nephew, making sure that he's okay. And it turns out that Gyo Ru is clearly his Achilles heel, and despite Sang Ko's best intentions to hide it, she can see straight through his facade. Gyo Ru, however, is not so easy to persuade, and he couldn't read the situation well and is absolutely devastated when Sang Ko tells him not to come looking for him when they head home. Sang Ko was at rock bottom, and the next day he wakes up feeling hungover and close to vomiting again, and Gyo Ru was heading out of his way. Ready to go to his annual picnic with his father, and now that Jung Yu isn't around anymore, it falls on Gyo Ru to keep the tradition alone. 
Namu convinces Sanko to tag along, reminding him of his guardian duties, and as Guru arrives at the theme park all alone, Sanko follows from afar. Guru watches each of the rides and then heads to the bathroom where a group of miners start bullying him. Thankfully, Sanko was there and placed some police siren noises on his phone outside, and this was enough to spook the kids as they head out and find themselves at Sanku's mercy. Eventually though, Sanku gets involved and rides with Gyoru, and he's terrified to begin with, but eventually his uncle convinces him to feel the wind on his face and enjoy the adrenaline rush. The final ride is the merry-go-round, but as the ride turns, Sanko notices his brother sitting on the horse next to Guru. It's a beautifully cathartic moment, but one that eventually ends with Guru going off alone and telling his uncle not to follow. Sanku obviously does just that, watching Guru from afar as he heads to various different food joints before arriving at the station. This, as it turns out, is the same station that Sanku visited in 1994, where he snuck in the back with Zhong Yu to celebrate the former's birthday. It turns out this all links to Sanku's original birthday wishes, which included going to different food joints and riding every ride in the amusement park. A year passes, and as we skip ahead to 1995, Danku's abusive dad passes away, and Sanku was due to go to an orphanage, but Jong Yu vows to make his birthday wish come true every year. Unfortunately, though, he doesn't show up, and this upsets Sanku, who finds himself alone and feeling betrayed. Three days pass, and still, he didn't show up. Back in the present, Sanku arrives and finds Guru making rock cranes and praying for health and happiness for someone Zhong Yu loves. This is, of course, for Sanku, and Sanku is angry, and all of this stems from the betrayal that he felt at being left on his birthday. When Guru catches up to him, he confirms that Zhong Yu had a nasty accident at the time he was supposed to meet the boy. Sanku didn't know this, but he did see the news reports about Sampong department store collapsing and Zhong Yu trapped there for three days and hospitalized because of the pain. Back home, Sanko goes searching through Zhong Yu's things and finds boxes of Nike shoes, and this stems back to Sanko's birthday wish, which also explains why he was at the department store when it collapsed. Trapped all the time, Zhong Yu collects the Nike box and could only think of his friend. He apologizes and weeps while being left under the rubble, and he even left a label from your brother on the side. These presents go back every year with Zhong Yu doing his best to make up for the year that he never showed up. As the episode closes, Sung Ko finds an adoption certificate to confirm that Gyu Ru isn't actually Zhong Yu's child. The next scene begins with some home videos, paving the way to show a 29-year-old called Seong Min. He grew up in the United States but found that a struggle to fit in and eventually got himself arrested. He eventually returned to Korea trying to find his birth mother, but this search was fruitless and was made worse by his inability to speak competent Korean. He had a heart problem as well, and he eventually found himself sleeping for the last time among a sea of rubbish and broken dreams. Meanwhile, Sanku starts washing the Move to Heaven van with Namu, and as they talk, Sanku senses that she likes Gyuru. It turns out that this dates all the way back to when she was six. But before the conversation could go any further, the pair are soon interrupted by another call coming in. This is for Seong Min, who was also known as Matthew. Apparently, he passed away thanks to his genetic condition, and he died in the Christian Motel, which the pair headed up to clean out. The scene was very grim, with trash thrown across the floor and bloodstains on the bed. As they clean up, Gyoru uncovers a necklace for Eiji, Matthew's dog. As Gyoru hurries off to investigate further, Sanko presses the social worker who was in charge of Matthew's case. His mother had issues seeing him, and this basically stems from the adoption being dissolved. His heart condition is what caused her to see Matthew off to the United States for 30 years, and upon his return though, she remained adamant that she didn't want to see him, and this also means that she won't receive Seong Min's belongings. 
Just like before with the notes, Gyoru puts all the pages of the books together, taping them back. Gyoru's genius brain flickers through the pages and stops at a picture of Yeon Jung, Seon Min's birth mother. Gyoru and Sang Ko track her down and confront the woman about Matthew's passing. Although she initially refuses to believe he's her child, it soon becomes apparent that he is in a roundabout way. It turns out she helped raise Matthew at a foster home, and Matthew was the last child that they had at home, and Seong Min believed that she was his mother all this time. Not understanding Korean fully and still learning, he saw the pictures and believed that they were linked together. With broken Korean, Matthew showed up at a bookstore signing and eventually changed his mind, telling her his name is Seong Min. He chose his American name instead, and this meeting was what drove him to drink and rip the pages out in the first place. This also came after being told his mother didn't want to see him, and Sian Ku talks about the disappointment and regret, using his own experiences as a way of channeling that through Ejeon's problems. After, they head to the Animal Medical Center, where AG was situated. His collar is placed back around his neck again, and the pair finally head back on the road, but a news report breaks featuring Yeon Jong. She delivers an impassioned broadcast addressing the entirety of Korea about the flawed overseas adoption process. She gives specific emphasis on how babies like Seong Min are stuck in the middle of all of this, and Gil Ru was smart and reveals that he too is a child like that. Back home, Sien Ko receives a call from Madam, confirming that the fight was at 11pm. He demands his documents be kept safe and vows to come after her if they're not. In the morning, Gyoru awakens to find Sien Ko cooking breakfast, identical to the way Jong Yeo did the day of his death. Gyoru immediately suspects his uncle is going to pass and becomes worried that he's terminally ill. In fact, he even swaps the plates over, just like before in the first episode. Sanku takes one last glance at his nephew before collecting his things and leaving, and it turns out that the other plate at the table was actually for Namu. As he turns and walks away, Sang Khan claims that he doesn't have a home for the arriving Namu. She immediately heads inside and admits that she has a bad feeling about all of this, but so does Gyoru, who happens to have heard Sun Ku's threatening chat the night before with Madam. Back home, Gyoru and Namu uncover the documents for Punch Drunk and realize that Sun Ku could be in serious danger. And lastly, we see Sun Ku fighting in the ring for his life. While he dances around the octagon, Gyoru and Namu race to the scene to check on him, and when Sanku notices them in the audience, it was just the distraction his opponent needed to illegally tuck a blade into his glove. Gyoru switches the lights off, grabbing Sanku and saving him from his fate. Bleeding from the head, Sanku promises the others that he doesn't have a punched drug syndrome as they head to the hospital. With them gone, police race to the scene and arrest everyone involved with the gambling den. It's clear that this experience has traumatized Guru, who finds himself struggling and having bad dreams. In the morning, Sanku hears on the news that the gambling den has been completely dismantled, and Guru turns the TV off though, reminding his uncle that they need to eat. However, a knock on the door brings lawyer O oh to the fray, and Gyoru had apparently been avoiding calls from the memorial center, and they want him to make a decision with the ashes. Gyoru hurries into the room alone, locking the door and sneaking out of the window. With him gone, Namu, her parents, and Sanku all hurry out to try and find the boy. While they were on the hunt, we received some flashbacks of Gyuru as a child, and he didn't speak as much as a kid, but his first proper words came from the Sea Life Center, where he began to repeat the different fish facts. Sanku goes hunting at home and finds a picture of Zhang Yu as a firefighter in the past, and believing this could hold a crucial clue, he races to the firehouse. Further flashbacks reveal a traumatic experience where Jung Yu found a child abandoned in a water tank cellar all alone. He checked up on the child and from there, they formed a bond to make sure he was okay. 
Knowing the baby could be sent off to an agency, Jung Gyu decided to adopt the child. In fact, Gyo Ru grew to become the mascot at the fire station. The family was happy, at least for a short while anyway, and while his mother passed, Gyo Ru was beside himself with grief and found it hard to believe that she was gone. Eventually, Jung Yoo spoke to his son, telling him that his mother is always in his heart and in his eyes. Back in the present, Sang Ko eventually finds Gyo Ru at the aquarium of their childhood town, a place that holds countless memories for the both of them. The vivid colors and enchanting marine life serve as a poignant backdrop to their reunion, and with a mix of anticipation and trepidation, Sang Ko approaches Gyo Ru, a rush of emotions welling up inside him. Taking a deep breath, he musters the curse to tell Gyoru something that he believes with every fiber of his being, the death still speak. It's a powerful statement that he hopes will provide Gyoru with the strength and comfort that he needs to face the challenges that lie ahead. In the days that follow, Senku dedicates himself to the overwhelming task of clearing out his father's room, and the room, once a sanctuary filled with memories and possessions, now feels empty and void of life. Yet Senko is determined to honor his father's legacy by organizing everything meticulously. As he goes through belongings and sorts through memories, he discovers a sense of closure and a newfound understanding of his father's life. During this deeply emotional segment, Gyoru experiences a transformative moment. He realizes that it is finally time to let go of the pain and grief that had weighed on him for so long, and as he continues to rummage through his father's belongings, Gyoru stumbles upon Jung Yu's phone, revealing a trove of cherished memories captured through photographs. Overwhelmed by a mix of sadness and nostalgia, Gyoru begins to scroll through the images, reliving the moments frozen in time. Suddenly, a video catches Gyoru's attention, and it's a heartfelt message recorded specifically for him by Jung Yu before his passing. In this poignant clip, Jung Yu expresses his love, regret, and longing for his son, leaving behind a final goodbye that resonates deeply within Gyoru's heart. The video becomes a treasured keepsake, a tangible reminder of the bond that they shared, and their love that will forever be endured. As time passes, Gyoru finds solace and support in the arms of his family and friends as they gather in a bid of final farewell for Jung Yu at the Memorial Center. The atmosphere is filled with a mix of sorrow and bittersweet memories as they share stories, laughter, and tears. As a symbol of eternal resemblance, a tree is planted in Jung Yu's honor, serving as a living testament to the impact that he had on those around him. Three months pass, and at the end of the guardianship marks a significant moment for lawyer O. Oh. Faced with difficult decision, he grapples with the weight of responsibility and the future of Gyoru's well-being. Unfortunately, Sanko finds himself disqualified in lawyer O's oh eyes, a bow that threatens to shatter Gyoru's hopes. But despite the setback, Gyoru remains firm in his desire for Sanko to continue as his guardian, confident in their connection and unwavering trust that he had placed in him. In a heartfelt plea, Gyoru expresses his personal wish, a request that leaves Sanko deeply moved. With a genuine beaming grin spread across his face, Senko casts aside his tough guy facade, revealing the gratitude that fills his heart. In that moment, it becomes clear that their bond transcends the limited confines of legal guardianship, emphasizing the power of the chosen family and the strength found in the unbreakable ties of love and commitment. Meanwhile, a girl shows up at Gyoru's house requesting his services for move to heaven, and a white butterfly lands on her head and eventually flies away.